Our dear Lord and our God, we thank you for another day. We praise your name. You have been blessing us richly and mightily in this great retreat. Lord, we pray that in this session, you will reveal yourself to everyone in here in Jesus' name. We are asking and praying that the Spirit of God will illuminate our hearts and bring us, O oh Lord, into the very blessings of God in this session. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, this session we have a topic, Daily Victory Over Besetting Sins and Lukewarmness. Daily Victory Over Besetting Sins and Lukewarmness. Uh, we turn our Bible, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I read there in verse 14. It says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savour of his knowledge by us in every place. There it tells us about triumph. That is victory. God's plan and God's will for us as believers is to have victory, triumph, and that on a daily basis. Uh, in Romans chapter 6, I read there from verse 15, the book of Romans chapter 6 from verse 15 down to 18. What then? Shall we sing, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked, that ye were the servants of sin. That was past tense. Ye were the servants of sin. But ye have obeyed from the herd that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Verse 18. Being, made free, being then made free from sin, that is salvation, ye became the servants of righteousness. From these verses we have read, it's very clear that it is God's perfect will and purpose that every believer, heaven-bound saints, will live daily victory, in daily victory over besetting sins and lukewarmness. Uh, Jesus Christ, in the days of his earthly ministry, he reiterated the importance of daily victory. In his message to the seven churches in Asia and also uh, to the, the apostles as well, they reiterated the same thing. While he was here, after he, he died and he resurrected and went back to heaven, and at his revelation to John, and also the apostles that followed after. Every one of them, they re-echoed this message that God wants his church to live victorious life. Uh, the seven churches, in the message of Jesus Christ to the seven churches in Asia, is a represent, which represent the churches of today. Uh, churches in this church age, we are represent, they represent the church, the seven churches in Asia. And uh, these seven churches in Asia, we look at them, each of them, Jesus Christ said something very, very important. And it's all revolving around overcoming, triumphing, victorious. And let's see a few of these verses in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. There it tells the church at Ephesus about the necessity of overcoming, triumphing, 
victorious in verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. To him that overcometh. And then in verse 11, to the church as manner is said, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh daily victory. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. In verse 17, uh, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So it's not, it wasn't only to the church at Pagamos or Smyrna or Ephesus, but to the churches. In this church age, it says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, to him that live victoriously, to him that triumph, will I give to it of the hidden manna, and will give him a wise stone. And in the stone, a new name written, which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it. In verse 26, to the church at Smyrna, I mean to the, sorry, church at Thyatira, verse 26, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, that is daily victory, daily victory unto the end, uh, to him will I give power over the nations. In chapter 3, verse 5, about the, the church at Sardis, it says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his holy angels, before his angels. In verse 12, to the church at Philadelphia, he said the same thing. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. So it's all he that overcometh. So that translates to living daily victorious life over besetting sins and lukewarmness while we are here on earth. In verse 27, in verse 21, it says, uh, to him that overcometh, that's to the church at Laodicea, the uh, lukewarm church, will I grant to sit with me in my throne to him that overcometh, even to the lukewarm church, uh, that is Laodicean church. So which means that whichever state we are spiritually, God wants us to live the victorious life over besetting sins and lukewarmness, actually, besetting sins gives birth to lukewarmness. When somebody is committing sin, it eventually results into lukewarmness in the spirit. And so to even this church that was lukewarm, characteristic of the lukewarm church today, Jesus Christ still encouraged that they should repent and so that they can overcome. In verse 27 uh, of Revelation chapter 21, Jesus Christ still, uh, the Bible tells us something that uh, cancels any form of notion that sin will enter heaven. He says, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. The Bible is very, very clear as to who will get into heaven. There shall in no wise, under no guise, under no circumstance, enter into it anything that defileth, that is sinful, that is ungodly, or worketh abomination. Uh, these verses 
uh, tells us very clearly the very mind of God for us. The word victory reminds every Christian that there is a fight to be fought and a race to be run. Uh, but God gives us grace in the running of that race. In Hebrews chapter 12, the book of Hebrews chapter 12, I read there from verse 1. And wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside. That means there is something for us to do, to overcome. Let us lay aside. We must deliberately lay aside the every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us besetting sins, common sins, is sins that we, uh, uh, easy, we easily fall into. And uh, it says, let us lay them aside and uh, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The race to heaven is the race set before us. And uh, God wants us to run and overcome and live by living daily victorious life here on earth over besetting sins and lukewarmness. Uh, because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, God has made provision for every believer to be victorious, uh, and uh, he is able to keep everyone who has believed on him from falling. Let's read in Jude verse 24. Jude verse 24, is, he says there that now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. God is able to keep us victorious and to present you faultless. Uh, faultless, that is the demand of scriptures. Faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Uh, in uh, if you look at Romans chapter 5, uh, verse 1, there the Bible tells us, it says that, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The believers at Rome, they uh, were justified from this verse we have read, justified by the blood of Jesus Christ, cleansed, saved, transformed. And uh, in chapter 6 of this same book, Paul the Apostle taught the Roman Christians, and by extension telling us today, the necessity of daily victory over the certain sins and lukewarmness. Uh, in chapter 6, <clears throat> reading there from verse 1, <clears throat> it says, What shall we say then? These were saved believers, believers who had been converted. We have read about their conversion in chapter 5. What shall we say then? <clears throat> shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we then that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism and into death, that like as Jesus, as, as Christ was raised from up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also, also should live in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. The Bible is very clear that henceforth, after our conversion, after we are born again, after we are saved, the evidence, the fruit, is that we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, 
we believe that we shall also live with him. Verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Verse 11, very important. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the loss thereof. Verse 13, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield your, yourselves unto God as those, those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin shall not have victory over you. Sin shall not triumph over you if we do all these things that have been highlighted. And as we look, uh, go into this message, we'll be looking at three major aspects. And uh, number one, warning against deceptive prophets and their versions of sin in the last days. Warning against deceptive prophets and their versions. They have their own version of sin. Their versions of sin in the last days. Number two, wonders of divine provisions. We give glory to God that there is divine provisions and is a wonder to all. Wonders of divine provisions for victory over sin and lukewarmness over sin and lukewarmness. Number three, wholehearted desire. Wholehearted desire and our path to victory over sin and lukewarmness. Uh, the Lord will help every one of us as we go on in this message so that by the grace of God, our daily life will be that of victory over besetting sins and lukewarmness in these last days. We look at point number one, warning against deceptive prophets and their versions of sin in the last days. Please, let's turn our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 23, the book of Jeremiah chapter 23, I read from verse 21. I have not sent these prophets, yet they run. I have not spoken unto them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way, from their sinful ways, from their unrighteous ways, and from the evil of their doings. That is the God says that those prophets who deceive the people, they don't turn them away from the evil of their doings. They rather encourage them in the evil of their doings. And that is not God's way. He says he, those prophets, he didn't send them. And uh, if, they, have, if he, they have spoken his word, they will have turned the people from their Ways. What is the way of God? Leviticus chapter 1, uh, chapter 20. What is the way of God? What is the will of God? What is the path? What is the way that God wanted the prophets to turn the people to? In Leviticus chapter 20, I read from verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Again, thou shalt... Thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth 
any of his seed unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones, and I will set my face against that man, and will cut him off from among his people, because he hath given his, of his seed unto Molech, and uh, to defile my sanctuary, and to profane my holy name. Verse 4. And if the people of the land do any ways hide their eyes from the man, when he giveth of his seed unto Molech, and killeth him not, and do, did nothing, and overlook the sin of that man, and just ignore, bypass, leave that man, not do anything, verse 5, then I will set my face against that man, and against his family, and will cut him off, and all that go a whoring after him to uh, commit Adam with Molech from among their people. And the soul <clears throat> that turneth after such and such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them, I will even set my face against the soul and we cut off him, cut him off from among his people. God says, if people are committing sin and somebody decide to overlook, bypass the priest, preacher, the prophet, they decide not to talk, he says, he will talk, he says, he will judge. Now verse seven, sanctify yourselves therefore, because I will judge if uh, deceptive prophets did not do anything, I will do something. So therefore, sanctify yourself and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Since we know that God does not change, he remains the same. So what he demanded then, he's still demanding today. Verse 8, and ye, ye shall keep my statutes and do them, I am the Lord God and the Lord which sanctify you. So we see that God's disposition is different from what we are seeing in these days. Now, in these last days, the world has no, as so our world, our societies have so much painted sin with so, such attractive colors that many people no longer perceive sin as anything sinful or anything serious or of, or of consequence. There are nations that are legalizing ungodly sinful practices and uh, what that translates to is that many people socially speaking they accepted those uh, uh, those laws and uh, so sin became something legally accepted in many social uh, uh, gatherings in many places all over the world and the gravity of sin the way God says sin and the consequences of sin no longer have any effect or impact on many people so and because Judgment is delayed by God immediately, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. The heart of man is fully set to keep doing evil, because, and also the society kind of legalized, modernized iniquity, sin. Uh, modern day preachers also deceive a lot of their members by teaching them that nobody can live victoriously over sin. They and that those who believe their erroneous teachings only have a form of godliness. The people who believe those erroneous teachings, they only have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of God in the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse a sinner and to make him a new creature. Some others 
uh, they teach that once you are saved, you are forever saved, even if you continue living in your sin, your cigarette smoking, your fighting, your lying, your immoral life, you, you are saved. That's what they tell them, but that's not what the Bible says. That was not what Jesus teaches us when he gave us the parable of the ten virgins. The ten virgins, uh, by the time the bridegroom came, five of them, their lamps had drawn out of oil. And so what they, they had the lamp of religion, but it was darkness. They were living in darkness. Men love darkness because their deeds were evil. So those people with empty lamps, just carrying lamps of religion, Jesus Christ said those virgins, those uh, foolish virgins, they didn't make it through because empty lamps, is darkness, and darkness translates to sin. And therefore, we see that those people didn't go in. So, uh, not only that, if you look at John's Gospel chapter 8, in verses 34 and 35, the Bible says that Jesus Christ said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. So, he says he was so... Uh, clear, and there was no addendum added to that statement. It says, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abided not in the house forever. So, which means Jesus was very clear in the days of his earthly ministry. What about in the book of Romans? We have read it in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? after we've been converted in chapter 5, after we've been justified in chapter 5 of Romans, shall we now continue in sin that grace may now abound? Since God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? In 1 John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it tells us, the apostle tells us very clearly, it says, he that committed sin is of the devil, and none of us will be of the devil in Jesus' name. In the New Testament, if you read in Deuteronomy chapter 22, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 22, uh, if I will just pick two verses there. In chapter 22, uh, I will read verses 20 and 21. It says, but if this thing be true, that and the tokens of virginity of uh, be not found for the damsel, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of the city shall stone her with stones that she die, because why? She had wrought folly in Israel to play the all in her father's house, so shalt thou put evil away from among you. In the Old Testament, if a lady, a married lady, commit, is going about committing immorality, sin, fornication, and sinning, messing up herself, on the day she gets married, it, it was discovered that the token of her virginity was not found. She was going to be stoned to death. But look at our society today. Nobody cares about all those things. Even though God is not asking us to stone anybody to death today, there is grace that forgives. Go and sin no more. There is grace that pardons. Go and sin no more. But that doesn't change God and his position concerning sin. We are, here we see that many young people commit immorality at large, and they don't feel, they still say they are born again, they still say they are Christians, they go to church, uh, but then uh, they, they, they live in sin, and they don't have any guilty conscience at all that they, the life they are living is condemned by God, and they don't, but God wants us to know that sin is sin, and sin has consequences as well. And he wants us to 
repent and accept Christ into our lives and be saved. And if we are saved, he wants us to live victorious life over besetting sins as well as lukewarmness. Uh, uh, we, uh, God wants us to know that he will judge, he will judge all forms of uh, immorality, unrighteousness, and therefore it is very important for us to uh, take this message, very, very important, and take it to God in prayer, and he will help every one of us in Jesus' name. In uh, Genesis chapter 2, if you read there in verse 17, you know, God told Adam, uh, he said, the day you eat of this, the tree, uh, the fruit of this tree, you will die. Let's read Genesis chapter 2 in verse 17. Uh, I want to point out something there because it's not good to be under deception. It's not good to be deceived at all. In chapter 2 verse 17 of Genesis, God said, it says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Spiritual death. Thou shalt surely die. Now, what did the devil say? Chapter 3, verse 4. Chapter 3, verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. So, can you see? The voice of false deceptive prophets is different from the voice of God. God says, if you do this, you will die, you'll be spiritually dead, you'll be lukewarm. The false prophet, the, the serpent came and said, you will not surely die. That's the same sound we are hearing today. And uh, as we consider such a very important message as this, we see that sin is ruinous and God wants us to live victorious lives as people who are saved over the certain sins and lukewarmness. Uh, that perception, that understanding, we create a passion, a desire in us to pray and look up to God's provision for daily victory and over besetting sins and lukewarmness. And it will also help us to avoid disappointment on the day of judgment. Uh, the Spirit of God is warning every heavenly bound believer to be weary of modern day deceptive teachers. They rob people of a broken heart, a contrite spirit that should take them to God to get the provisions that Christ has provided for us at Calvary for our victory over the certain sins and lukewarmness. I go to point number two, wonders of divine provisions for victory over sin and besetting and uh, lukewarmness. Wonders of divine provisions for victory over sin and lukewarmness. In, Luke, uh, in Isaiah chapter 64, the book of Isaiah chapter 64, I read there in verse six. It says, but we all, every one of us born into this world, are uh, all as an unclean thing, and uh, all our righteousness, I read that again, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we, do, we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away, away from God. And when somebody is away from God, the next thing is lukewarmness, lukewarm spirit. And in Isaiah chapter 53, we will see the provisions of the Lord for our victory. God wants us to have victory. In verse uh, 4, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4, surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But 
he was wounded for our transgressions. He came all the way from heaven. You know, you can picture in your mind the glory of heaven, the beauty of heaven, angels singing there. Jesus left all those to come and be born in a manger. It's a serious business. God meant business. It's something very more than what we can humanly imagine. And God has made a provision. He was bruised. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Uh, we want to look at, in this subsection, Christ, our Savior, the source of victory. Christ, our Savior, the source of victory. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 21. Matthew, chapter 1, we read there in verse 21. There, the Bible tells us about this Jesus Christ and the salvation he brought to all mankind. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Uh, we all know when somebody is rescued, saved from fire, from drowning, from accident, that means he's saved alive. It's not, he didn't perish in that thing. The same thing, when he saves us, he has the power. We don't have the power of our own, but he has the power. This is divine provisions, and we must believe it to receive it. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, who or his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, on the cross, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. So Jesus shouldn't have died or for him to have borne all those severe pain, shame, and sorrow, it means that God can do a miracle in our heart that will change us, that will enable us to live victorious life. Uh, subsection number two, Christ, our strength, the surety, the surety, assurance of salvation. Christ, our strength, uh, of our own, we are feeble, we are weak, but Christ is our strength. When we talk of victorious living, Christ is our strength. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, I read there in verse 6. It says there, for when, for, for when we were yet without strength, weak, falling into sin, rumbling in sin, unable to stand, while we were yet without sin, in due season, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for the ungodly uh, so that our weakness can be as, uh, exchanged for his strength to be able to live victorious Christian life. The ungodly is without strength from that verse. If after we are saved, we are still confessing sin and roaming in sin every day, uh, we, that means that we are denying the power of what Christ actually wants to accomplish in our lives. We must believe this. We must receive it, and God will do it in our lives. Christ is the strength of believers. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, we read there in verse 17, it says, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me he, and strengthened me, strengthened me. The, uh, the, the victory we are talking about comes through the strength we receive 
in Christ, strengthen me. Uh, God will strengthen every one of us in Jesus' name. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. Hebrews chapter 2, we read there in verse 18. The Bible tells us, it says, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. He is able to strengthen them that are tempted. He is able to support them that are tempted. These are Christ's provisions, God's provisions for our victory as Christians over besetting sins and lukewarmness. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 4, reading there from verse 14, uh, reading from verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Verse 15, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly. Say what Jesus has provided for us, believers, let us therefore come boldly. Come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. In 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, I read there from verse 6, 1st epistle of Peter chapter 5, I read from verse 6. It says, humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Why, do we, why is he telling us, humble yourself? Because if somebody is agitating and arguing and saying, no, there's no, it's not possible to live without sin, he is not humble because God is saying, I'm a holy God. You are my people. I've saved you. I want you to be holy. I want you to be uh, clean. I'm able to do this in your life. I'm able to give you the strength. And the person is kicking and arguing. That is not good. That's not the will of God. It says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that, ye may, that he may exalt you, he may give you the victory, he may strengthen you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cared for you. Now watch verse 8. It says, be sober, uh, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, actually, when we are talking about victory, we have a three, threefold enemies. Number one of them is the, is the devil, the world, and our flesh. Now, so the devil here, he says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil. He was the one that went to uh, uh, Eve in the Garden of Eden and deceived Eve. He says, your adversary, the devil, will come to you also to tempt, to deceive you, he says, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, seeking whom he will downfall, he will befall on this Christian journey. By the grace of God, the devil will not be able to befall any one of us in Jesus' name. Verse 9, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same affliction, you are not the only one, Christian, you are not the only one going through all those things. He says, you're knowing that the same affliction are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Uh, then, subsection number three, Christ, our shepherd, supplicating for our victory. Christ, our shepherd, praying, supplicating for our victory. Uh, all this showing us that God has made provisions. He knows that of our own, we don't have all the, we ha don't have the provisions to live victoriously over besetting sins and, be and lukewarmness. But he has made the provisions for us. We must believe, we must receive, 
we must, uh, we must appropriate those provisions for our lives in John's Gospel chapter 10. John chapter 10, we read there from verse 11. John's Gospel chapter 10 from verse 11 down to 14. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Verse 11, verse 12. But he that is an hurling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf cometh, catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hurling fleeth because it's an hurling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and I'm known of mine. So we see there that Christ is the shepherd. He is the shepherd over you as a Christian. And uh, a shepherd will lead his own away from danger, from evil, and from damnation. So be as a shepherd, he supplicates, he watches over us. In Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, there we read about his priesthood ministry for us as Christians. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Wherefore, he is able also to save unto the utmost there that come unto God by him. You are born again, you have come to God by him. He's able to save you to the utmost. That is divine provision. Seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession, prayer for them. He is praying. Jesus is praying for believers. He is praying for all those who come to him. This is part of divine provisions for believers. It is ours to believe. It is ours to appropriate. It is ours to bring in into our lives. In John's Gospel, chapter 17, John chapter 17, in reading from verse 9, it says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, and they are thine, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thy name, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. Keep through thine own name. Can you see the prayer of Jesus Christ? Verse 12. While I was in the, with them in the world, I kept them. The Lord will keep you, my brother. The Lord will keep you, my sister. Is part of divine provision for us so that we will be able to live the life that is pleasing to God. I kept them. And uh, none, uh, I, I, while I was in the world with, uh, with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition. None of us will be lost in Jesus' name. That the scriptures might be fulfilled in verse 13. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word. And the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not for the, that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. My brothers... My sisters, the Lord will keep every one of us. In this journey, the Lord will keep you. We need to believe what God says. We need to put aside what the false teachers and false prophets are saying. We need to believe the provisions of Calvary, of the cross, of the Lord Jesus Christ for us, for victorious life over besetting sins and lukewarmness, 
and it will be so in our lives in Jesus' name. Lastly, before we pray, we look at point number three, wholehearted desire. Wholehearted desire and our path to victory over sin and lukewarmness. Our path to victory over sin and lukewarmness. I've read before, I will read it again in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The Bible says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph. That is his plan. That is his purpose. He causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. So, if somebody is telling us that, oh, you can never triumph in Christ Jesus, you must always be a slave to sin, even though you say you are born again, that, is, that runs contrary to what God is saying. And he says, he causes us to triumph in Christ, in Christ and make it manifest the server of his knowledge by us in every place. To have daily victory and uh, over besetting sins and lukewarmness, we have seen the provisions of God. On top of that, it's not just the provisions of God. We as human beings, we as Christians, we have our own part to play. Now we go over our own part. We have our own part to play. Uh, when God told Adam, don't eat of the tree of the, of the fruit of this tree, God has giving him the provisions of other trees he could eat of, but don't eat of this. So it was Adam's responsibility. He has a part to play not to go and eat of that fruit. So we also have a, a part to play, and I will quickly list them. Number one, prayerfulness with watchfulness. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, I read from verse 31. Luke chapter 22, uh, verse 31. Jesus Christ calls Simon, and he says uh, in verse 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sit you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee. There is power in prayer. I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, when thou art restored, when thou art brought back to faith, strengthen your brethren, who had also fallen aside. And uh, so Jesus Christ here tells us that there is power in prayer. He called Peter. He said, Simon, let me tell you something. There is when you were probably, maybe you were sleeping, Satan in his cohort with his evil angels, they were planning, they mentioned your name. They said, that guy, Peter, we are going to get him down. We are going to bring him down. And Jesus Christ said, Peter, this is what the devil is planning against you. But he says, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Prayerfulness and watchfulness. In verse 40 of that same chapter, Verse 40, and when he was at that place, he, was, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. Pray. Is the solution, is the solution to victorious living. Prayerfulness. Uh, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, Jesus told them similar thing about uh, praying. When they were the garden, in the garden of Gethsemane, it says, watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, willing to follow God, willing to go to heaven, willing to be a Christian. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The flesh is an, a, one of the enemies of our faith. And so the flesh is weak, but the antidote, the solution, the what will grant us the victory, watch and pray. And uh, in First Peter chapter 1, uh, First Peter chapter 5, rather. First Peter chapter 5, I'd read it before, I read it again. It's very important for us. Things we must do on our own part. First Peter chapter 1, verses, chapter 5, rather, verses 8 and 9. Be sober, 
that's for us to do. You see, brethren, a talkative will be a sinner. That's what the Bible says. It says, in the multitude of words, they are wanted not sin. So if somebody, if a Christian is a talkative, a gossiper, a backbiter, he will always be, he cannot live a victorious life over sin. Uh, he, he says, be sober, be vigilant. For the devil, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Our prayer is that the Lord will keep every one of us. We'll be watchful, we'll be prayerful. Satan will not be able to devour any one of us in Jesus' name. Uh, the number two, under this point number three, uh, subsection two, is purity through the word. Purity through the word of God. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119, 119, uh, we read there from verse 9, Psalm 119, verse 9, it says there, it says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Uh, brethren, uh, we are in uh, a, a, a kind of a world that evil is increasing. And that's what the Bible says, according to 2 Timothy 3, 13. Evil men and seducers shall be waxing worse and worse. And many people are finding, trying to find how can we get the young people to live clean life, to walk uprightly before God. And, and uh, some have come up with maybe some games, some, some activities, and some other. Those things are good. But the real solution is Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? According to thy word. The word of God in the heart of our young people is, will give them victory. In the heart of adults will give us victory. The word of God, verse, verse 10, with my whole heart have I sought thee, O oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Verse 11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That is it. The more of the word of God we keep in our hearts, we have in our hearts, the more victorious we'll be. And uh, God has so much favored us, blessed us in this ministry that we have the word of God all around us. Talk of our Bible study classic. Talk of our revival hour, really reviving indeed. Talk of our leaders, leaders meeting messages, workers meeting messages, retreat. Now we are having Easter retreat. Retreat messages, uh, ministers conference messages, all those messages, they are keeping us strong because the word of God, wherewith us shall a young man make his way clean by taking heed thereto according to thy word. The reason why young people, even adults, are struggling with sin is because the word of God is not really much in our hearts because the more of it we have in our hearts, the more victory we have. Jesus Christ overcame in, John, uh, in Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, when the devil came to tempt him, he overcame by the word. And if we will have the word, if we will read the word, memorize the word, live by the word, by the grace of God, the Lord will give us victory in Jesus' name. He tells us in John chapter 15 verse 3, he says, Ye are clean by the word which I have spoken unto you. Ye are clean. The word of God has power to clean, cleanse, and purge, and purify. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, Deuteronomy chapter 17, in verses 18 and 19, uh, it says, And it shall be, when he seated upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that, which is before the priests, 
the Levites, verse 19, and he shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all his words, the words of this law, and these statutes to do them. So, in the old, uh, here, whenever a king, uh, uh, when king was to be chosen in Israel, that king must, with his own hand, write out a copy of the law from the hand of the priest. He must write, as he's writing, the thing is getting engraved in his heart, embedded in his heart, so that he will fear God. He will fear God all his life. And uh, the fear of God in us is the beginning of victory over sin and lukewarmness. And number three, Keep your heart with all diligence. Uh, our heart is the battleground for Satan's temptations. It is Satan's target to weaken, weigh down, pollute the thoughts of a believer. Our hearts must not be loose or lousy. In uh, Proverbs chapter 4, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Uh, those are the things we must do in, uh, in, in, to complement the provisions of Calvary in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Every, every sin virtually starts from the heart. And uh, if we can resist the devil, if we can cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus, if we can pray, if we can overcome from our heart, we will remain overcomers every day in Jesus' name. Number four, fellowship. In First John chapter 1, verse 3, we are told there the essence, the need for fellowship. Uh, uh, fellowship with God and fellowship with fellow brethren. In 1 John chapter 1, we read there in verse 3. There it reads, it says, that that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, and that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So when we have fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and have fellowship with the brethren, it helps us to, to, to stand strong, you see, uh, to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. The Bible tells us that we should avoid that. Ephesians 5, 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. You see, if your friends, your fellowship, your association is evil association, it makes you to be unstable in the Christian life. But by the grace of God, God wants us to uh, make a fellowship around him and then around the people of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, chapter 6 rather, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I read there from verse 14. It says... Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath, hath Christ with Belial? Or what path hath he that believeth with an infidel? Or what, and what agreement? Maybe marriage agreement? or other forms of business agreement, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Year for year the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. That's the solution. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord and touch not, our own part, touch not 
the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and you shall be, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord God Almighty. Uh, daily victory uh, requires that we cut away from unequal yoke and have friends among children of God, friends a, a brother to brothers, sisters to sisters, uh, by the grace of God. In then, number five, obedience. Uh, we are to be obedient to the, uh, to, the, to the word that we are hearing in Romans chapter 6. Uh, Romans chapter 6, I read from verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves, or ye also yourselves, to be dead, Indeed, unto sin. That's number one thing we need to obey. Reckon yourself to be dead to sin. Count yourself as a believer that you have given your life to Christ. You are not expected to be modeling in sin and or be lukewarm. So count yourself. Reckon yourself that by the grace of God, I have repented. I have accepted Christ into my life. I have nothing to do with that That way of life anymore, I reckon myself dead to that way of life. Then in verse 12, it says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. The word reign there is another word for dominion uh, over you or have victory over you in your mortal body. And uh, uh, it, it says, let not sin therefore reign. So which means it is what God expects us to do. He won't do it for us. You have to do that one. Let not. Do not let. Likewise, reckon ye yourself to do not allow sin. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. And then three, neither, verse 13, neither yield yourself you, your members, when it says your members, your heart, your hands, your feet, your mouth, every part of your body, neither yield your members. So which means this is in our own capacity to do. Don't yield. Refuse to yield. Decide not to yield. <clears throat> your members, your eyes, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. If we do all these things, you know what it says in verse 14? It says, sin shall not have dominion over us. Sin shall not have dominion over us in Jesus' name. Uh, in number six, uh, abide in Christ. Abide in him. In first. Uh, in uh, First John chapter three verse five, First John chapter three in verse five, it says there, the it says, and now, and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Now verse six. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Look at that phrase. Uh, uh, a, or it's, it's a sentence. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. So which means that the secret of overcoming is that we abide in him. Abide in Christ. And if we will abide in him, we will have victory. It is the, it is the word of God. It is the promise of God to us. If we will abide in him, John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me, we cannot live victorious Christian life. Without me, without Christ, 
we cannot live above sin. Without Christ, we cannot overcome big certain sins and lukewarmness. He says, without me, ye can do nothing. Ye can do nothing. The Lord will help every one of us who will abide in Christ in Jesus' name. Uh, your daily quiet time, your uh, walk with him, abiding in him, uh, and he abiding in you, his words abiding in us, very, very important. Lastly, share your faith. The more we share our faith, the more you reinforce that by the grace of God, the sinful life you have left behind is no longer for you. And therefore, the sharing of your faith strengthens the inward grace in us to overcome and remain overcomers. Uh, the Lord wants, in conclusion, the Lord wants every believer to overcome. Everyone who has come to him, and if you are there, you are not yet saved, you are not born again, you are not converted, the first step you need to take is you need to acknowledge that you are a sinner. Two, repent of your sins wholeheartedly. Turn away. Talk, talk, talk to the Lord and ask the Lord to come into your heart. Believe in that sacrifice that Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. He died for your sins. He rose up for our justification. And so invite him into your heart and ask him to be your savior from this very day. And for if you are saved, God wants us to live victoriously over besetting sins and lukewarmness. Uh, in in uh, uh, those, all the passages we have read today, including the ones in Revelation, Jesus Christ kept reiterating the fact that he that overcometh, he that overcometh, he that overcometh, he that triumph, he that overcomes. We are going to go to the Lord in prayer and overcome to the end. So we are going to go to the Lord in prayer now. I want you to go to the Lord in prayer to go and pray. I want you to talk to the Lord because this is a very serious business. It's very, very important. We are on a journey. We want to overcome. God will help us to overcome in Jesus' name. Sin will not enter heaven. Sin will not enter heaven. See here what Charles Wesley Nilo says in his song. He says, heaven is a holy place. Filled with glory and grace, sin can never enter there. All within its gates are pure, from defilement kept secure. Sin can never enter there. Sin can never enter there. So if at the judgment bar, sinful spots, your soul shall mar, you can never enter there. He says, if you hope to dwell at last, when your life on earth is past, in that home so bright and fair, you must here in this world be cleansed from sin. Have the life of Christ within. You may live in sin below. Heaven's grace refused to know, but you cannot enter there. <clears throat> you cannot enter there. It will stop you at the door, bar you out forever. Sin can never enter there. If you cling to sin till death, when you draw your latest breath, you will sink in dark despair to the region of the lost, thus to prove at awful cost that sin can never enter there. Sin can never enter there. Sin can never enter there. So if at the judgment bar, sinful spots, your soul shama, you can never enter there. But God loves us. He wants us to enter there. I want you to pray with all your heart. I want you to commit yourself to God. Let's take advantage. Let's avail ourselves of the provisions of grace. It's not by our power. It's not by our doing. 
But Christ has made these provisions. God wants to do it for us. And we also have our own part to play. Watch and pray. And all, all the other things we have listed, uh, we, God wants us to live that victorious Christian life by the grace of God, by his grace. Because he says, without me, ye can do nothing. If we will call upon him, he will help us. If we will pray to him, he will help us to live that victorious Christian life. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Almighty God, we have heard your word today. So plain, so clear. Oh Lord God, we are asking and praying that every one of us who have heard this word and we have called upon you today, Lord, that will be beneficiary, will be living every day, daily victory over besetting sins and lukewarm spirit in Jesus' name. Oh God, we will overcome Satan, we will overcome self, we will overcome the world, we will overcome the, the flesh, we will overcome every evil every day by your living grace and by the prayer Jesus is praying for his own in Jesus' name. Thank you for answering our prayers. Glory be to your holy name. In Jesus' name, keep every one of us steadfast to the end, pure to the end, victorious to the end. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you. You have called us to a glorious time. I will pray, Lord, none of us will miss our chance in Jesus' name. We are part of this army of God moving on to glory land. I will pray nothing will cancel our place in your kingdom. We are asking the Lord as we come to this final message, the spirit of the conqueror. You grant to everyone in Jesus' name. As we go out of the retreat today, power, resurrection power, renewed power, regenerating power, reviving power will follow us in Jesus' name. Speak to what your hearts right now. Inject us with your power. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God has blessed you already. You can sit down. I'm coming to Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable unto his death, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Romans 8, verse 37. It says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him that loved us in all the things in your life, all the challenges of your life, you'll be more than a conqueror in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 12, I read from verse 11. Revelation chapter 12, reading from verse 11. And they overcame him, and they overcame him, and they conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives until the death. Our victory has come. Through Christ's indwelling resurrection power, you will win in every battle. You will have victory every area of your life in Jesus' name. You'll have victory over sin. I can't hear your amen. Victory over self. 
victory over Satan. Those three folds uniting together the enemies of your soul, sin, self, and Satan, you have the victory. Over corruption, over compromise, over carnality, you are going to have victory. Over the fear of man, over falsehood, over fraudulence, you will have victory in Jesus' name. You are going to have victory over worldliness, 